then Jasmine Crockett says, please tell me what that has to do with Merrick Garland. Uh, MTG responds by saying, I think your fake eyelashes are messing up what you're reading. And just just set it off. They were going after each other on, about how they look. People screaming out, strike that from the record, strike that. <laughs> and it's so interesting that uh, these types of things that are happening yeah. in our federal government. Well... This is not new. This this name calling, you know, Thomas Jefferson's hit hitman and um, in the campaign called John Adams a hermaphrodite. Uh, Adams hit back that Jefferson wanted to legalize incest. Right. These personal pot shots are not new. Hello. And welcome in to Semi Some Stuff podcast. I'm Cameron Abrams, reporter here at the Texan, and I'm joined today, once again, by senior reporter Brad Johnson. Once again. Once again. This is becoming a tradition now. Yes. One of my favorite things to do here at the Texan is for us to just sit down and riff on the news. Yeah. It's really fun. Uh, we begin tons of great feedback, been getting some great emails from listeners, so keep that up and Leave a review if you like the podcast. But before we get into it today, we had some breaking news. Breaking news that early this morning on Friday, this is what, uh, May 17th. Yes. The uh, weekend of the PGA Championship. Scotty Scheffler. Scotty Scheffler, number one golfer in the world. UT Longhorn. Oh, he's been arrested. He was arrested. (laughs) On his way to the golf course. I, I haven't looked at it. So what was he arrested for? So there was... Something to do with an accident outside the um, Valhalla Golf Course. Where is that? Um, where the PGA Championship is happening. Oh, it's in Louisville, Kentucky. And it sounded like Scheffler, he was on his way to the course. His tee time was at 10 a.m. Okay. Uh, of course, this is Eastern time. And uh, he ended up in the back of a police car. <laughs> Not going <laughs> to the driving range to get ready for his his uh, this would be the the second round of the PGA Championship. Not ideal. Not <laughs> ideal way to start. Um, he is though scorching hot in terms of his his golf play right now, and yeah. so he needed something to bring him da- back down to earth. And this this was it. Was there something going on behind the scenes? No. Other golfers trying to take him down. Maybe maybe Rory McIlroy <laughs> saw this as his opportunity, um, but. Yeah, there was just, it sounded like there was a misunderstanding about the way traffic was going, and um, Scheffler was trying to get in with the golfers, um, and the police didn't recognize him as one of the golfers, <laughs> and so... He doesn't have a badge or something, like, even just your ID, like, hey guys, like, you should know who I am. I, I guess not, and yeah. so he, um, yeah, they they detained him and arrested him, and there's a... Uh, mugshot. Mugshot. Yeah. 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 So, uh, but as of now, he is currently playing. He got out in time, made his tea time, mm. and uh, maybe, maybe uh, it'll be something like you know, hell hath no fury like a Scotty Scheffler scorned. You know. Yeah. He, well, uh, <laughs> we've had. He might. He might play the best round of his life after this, or the worst. It's going to be one or the other. Well, John Daly, Tiger Woods. Yeah. Both have been arrested. Yeah. I, I, the memes have been amazing. 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 <laughs> the big dog Tiger Woods meme yeah. <laughs> has has been frequent on my timeline since then. So, yeah, it's it's just funny because it's like, first off, he was driving himself. You know, yeah. you think a huge event like this, you know, maybe get picked up mm-hmm. by the PGA or an Uber. Nope, just driving myself to the golf course, play yeah. another round, yeah. and then the police not recognizing who he is. It's like, yeah. Come on, guys. There was no, there was no alcohol in play, from my understanding. It's yeah. not like a DUI situation. Um, sounds like just a misunderstanding. And uh, but why the, arrest the guy I don't over know. a simple misunderstanding like I that? Maybe the body cam footage will come out. Well, yeah, it sounded like they had the road blocked, and he tried to get around and yeah. go with all the other golfers, and wow. that was not something the cop there was having at the time. Yeah, but what a start to the. 2024 PGA Championship. Yeah, what a what a great start to the podcast, though. It's hilarious news, but we're gonna get into the meat of it here. Um, we are recording this um, on May 17th, like you mentioned, and we're gonna be releasing this after the RPT chair vote. 
But there's been some big news. In the meantime, Matt Makoviak, he's made a late run mm-hmm. at the chairmanship. Uh, he put out a medium post where he sort of explained his reasons why he was going to run. Um, I'll read a little bit uh, from it here so the listeners can understand. This was towards the end of his post here. He said, quote, the cold reality is that RPT is inexplicably and unacceptably unprepared for the most important election in our lifetime. It does not have to be this way. A serious state party with serious people running it would raise $5 million in new money, hire 35 more staff, partner with our nominees, statewide officials. He goes on and on here. Um, he ends it by saying, quote, one thing is abundantly clear. It is time for change at RPT. President Donald Trump needs it. Senator Ted Cruz needs it. Texas needs it. America needs it. The time is now. So really hyping up the moment, um, saying it doesn't have to be this way. Uh, it's the most important election of our lifetime, really building it up. Um, and then he actually made his announcement uh, on Mark Davis that he will be running. So before we get into the actual news and maybe you can give some insight on the different candidates, why don't you just explain a little bit about why the RPD chair is so important? Why, why has this been so hyped up? Yeah. Well, I guess it, it depends on who you ask why it's so important. Um, you know, the current chair, Matt Rinaldi, has taken a position that he's really going to focus on um, legislative priorities and retribution for Republicans he seem, or he feels are insufficiently conservative. He's gotten very involved in especially the House Speaker's race against Dade Phelan, mm-hmm. uh, various other incumbent uh, elections um, against the incumbents in, in the Texas House, um, really has taken a an antagonist position towards the body he used to be within. He used to be a state rep. Right. Um, and so oh, there's a constant fight. This thing's been going on for years. This is not new. This is just the latest chapter. A constant fight over the direction of the Republican Party of Texas. You have one faction, this is broadly speaking, you know, there, there are ma- many individuals who, you know, fit along the spectrum one way or the other between these two poles. Right. But on, on one side, the faction that thinks the Republican Party needs to basically be a, ha- a hammer against incumbent Republicans who don't meet their standards Mm -hmm. policy-wise. And then you have this other poll of individuals who think that the party should focus more than anything else on electoral functions, getting out the votes, um, flipping seats from Democrat to Republican, um, and not engaging in these intra-party squabbles Mm -hmm. uh, electorally, staying out of primaries. And that was something he said on Mark Davis, this is a radio show today, that the party should be like Switzerland. Mm. They should be, um, you know, focusing on the end game of November, not March or these May runoffs. And that is the actual responsibility of the party. Raise money, help get Republicans elected. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially it. Some room to wiggle on that either way. Yeah. Um, And then, you know, those of Rinaldi's stripe would say, you know, we're not... We want to win elections too. Uh, we want to win the um, uh, the general election as well. Flip seats, but that is not the only responsibility. There is a responsibility to ensure that uh, elected officials are passing conservative things. And and then you have the elected officials that would say, "Well, we did pass conservative things. We passed right. the heartbeat bill, a banned abortion, um, you know, uh, passed constitutional carry, right. all these things." It's a constant fight of, you know, where's the line on what's accept- on the, the acceptability standard? Um, and then you have just personal grudges in the middle of this. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Rinaldi, uh, he tore into Makoviak when he announced. He told oh. me um, that uh, I think Carl Rove and TLR were, un- were unhappy with their chosen candidates, so now they're looking for Makoviak to replace Dana Myers as their standard bearer. He tore into him, calling him a, a grifter and a self-promoter, mm. um, all those things. And then, you know, Makoviak hit back at Rinaldi, saying he's basically run the party into the ground mm. uh, financially. And a lot of a lot of back and forth on this. It's just, you know, no holds barred political fighting. Yeah, and it's interesting because for the RPT chair, the two different directions you sort of explained. One, the fundraising aspect 
getting people out to vote. And then the other side, targeting maybe moderates, uh, incumbents, and trying to put more conservative people in those positions, mm-hmm. really focusing on individual races. Mm-hmm. How much bearing uh, or does the RPT chair really have an ability to point policy in a certain direction? Or because like, there are certain party platforms mm-hmm. that Republicans are adhering to. Does that really sway um, elected officials when they're actually in office? I think the biggest pull that at least the, right now the party chair has is influence on the grassroots, channel, channeling their anger in certain directions. In this case, you know, against Speaker Dade Phelan. Um, they're like the captain on the ship, like controlling the rudder. Exactly. Like where they're going. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the other side would argue he's done that, Rinaldi's done that at the expense of making the party a, a massive, well-funded um, political electoral operation. And that is going to come back to bite Republicans. Who knows? You know, we'll see on, we'll see in, in May, it, later this month, and then um, on uh, uh, in November. But th- these two, these are two entirely different worldviews in terms of the party, its direction, its responsibilities, and there's really no bridging the gap between those. Yeah, and we are recording this um, and, uh, before the vote happens. It's going to be released after the vote happens. So it's it, why don't you kind of run through so just people understand um, what so, these two polls, where some of these candidates line up on these polls because there's it's a big yeah. field now yeah um you know i think they all fall somewhere along the spectrum they're not none of them are in one camp or the other entirely um you know based on responses that have, that have been made ben armenta dana myers both kind of in makoviak now fall more towards the electoral function at least that's where the, the emphasis needs to be mm-hmm. um Abraham George, who is Rinaldi's handpicked uh, successor, um, he is he falls more in the uh, use the party as a hammer uh, mm-hmm. against elected officials. You know, he was he ran against the state rep before he jumped into this race. Um, he's very much in the Paxton camp, mm-hmm. retribution against the House and, and feeling for the impeachment. Uh, I'd say Mike Garcia is kind of in the middle there. Um, you know, we. Mackenzie and I talked about this race generally a lot in the um, yeah. the last um, what is that podcast called? Smoke filled <laughs> room. <filled. laughs> um, I'd say yeah. We so we have we have generally I think the Abraham George camp, and then you have all these other candidates that are trying to that are vying for the vote of delegates that are anti George, defend Texas Liberty, Rinaldi. You know it's it, those are generally the two camps right now. And the delegates are the ones who vote for the RPT chair. Yes. It's a quite a bit it's, complicated. It's complicated, yeah. But and when Mackenzie and I recorded, we, we didn't know the rules explicitly well. I didn't yeah. explain it very well and were frankly wrong about how it's elected. So I guess I'll just say it now, even though it's going to be after the fact. So you have Senate district conventions, 31 of them. The delegates in there, they will vote both for a nominations committee member and then for... Uh, a nominee for chair. And after that happens, it'll go to the nominations committee. I think to be considered by the nominations committee, you have to win three Senate caucuses. And then from there, the, um, the nominations committee will vote. And if nobody has 16 conve- uh, Senate districts in the first round, those um, nominations committee members will then be untethered from whomever it is that their Senate caucus voted for. Uh, and then it'll basically be elimination. Mm-hmm. So if, if, if you no one gets to 16 after the first round, then you'll remove, I think, the, the lowest vote total okay. candidate. And then so on and so forth until you have someone that win that reaches 16. Okay. From there, it'll go to the floor and you'll have um, the delegates there overall give an up or down vote. And usually they'll say yes, they'll just. So really it's one in the Senate caucuses and in the nominations committee. And what 
kinds of people make up the individuals in these delicate positions, caucus positions? Are these um, former elected representatives? Are these just activists? Are these all just, over the place? Uh, all over the place. Okay. Yeah. So you have you'll have state reps that are delegates. You'll have um, you know political operatives, consultants that are delegates. You'll have just regular activists that are delegates. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's all over all over the place. Um, where would you say um, it like? finger in the air, like where the wind's blowing in terms of how delegates have, are sort of feeling the type of person they want to run the RPT mm -hmm. chair. Because it, they're coming out of a Rinaldi chairmanship. Yeah. Do they, are you sort of getting the vibe they want to continue in that direction? Or do they want to go somewhere in the middle? Do they yeah. want to go to the other pole of? Well, I think it's telling that none of the candidates have explicitly taken the position of just focus on elections and nothing else. Mm -hmm. That tells you where the activists' um, you know, opinions lie on this. They want some involvement. How much, that varies, right? Mm -hmm. But um, this is not a, there's no candidate that wants explicitly party to stay entirely out of the legislative business, entirely out of primaries. Well, uh, Makoviak did say the party should stay out of primaries, um, but he, he tinged it with, you know, you have to respect the will of the, the voters on this and just let it be. Mm -hmm. um, but regardless, no one really is representing that poll explicitly. Right. Um, but generally, I think it comes down to the George camp, and he's got the backing of Rinaldi, Paxton, um, arguably two of the biggest influences in this sphere right now, mm -hmm. the party activist sphere. Um, but then you have you know other candidates, Myers, who's the current vice chair, you have Mike Garcia, who's been in, thing, around, in around this business for a long time. Uh, ben Armenta and Weston Martinez have both run for statewide positions before, have never won or come close to winning, but they've been in it. They uh, have name ID. Around. Yeah, they have some level of name ID. Yeah. Um, question is, how much name ID is there among delegates? Yeah. I don't know. Well, people listening, they might just come out of next week and see someone got elected, mm -hmm. right? And so just to give some insight, how much jockeying goes on behind the scenes? Oh, like, so it, much. Are they, <laughs> well, talk a little bit about that. Like, is there, like, what kinds of things are being discussed? Is it explicitly about um, the direction of the party? Is it yeah. about who's going to endorse who, who's going in, to, in upcoming races? Is what what is jockeying behind yeah. the scenes sort of look like? Probably varies based on the constituency that that given person is talking to at the moment. But generally, you know, right now conversations are happening where they're trying to recruit their supporters to, uh, you know, pledge to nominate them in these conventions and then second that nomination. Then recruiting delegates in those conventions to win or to vote for not only vote for your candidate. Um, but then whoever you get recruiting someone to, to be the nominee for the nominations committee and getting them to commit strongly yeah. to your candidate rather than when it's untethered, if it gets there, jumping for another candidate. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you want your strong ally in that position, especially on the nominations committee. And so there's that. Um, you know, jockeying over personalities, of course, is always there. Yeah. You know, the... Um, whether Abraham George is, you know, quote, going to doom the party or whether, you know, Dana Myers is going to let Republican elected officials do whatever they want and never hold them accountable. You know, those are the accusations that are flying all over the place right now. Right. So um, overall, though, it's, it's a bunch of different campaigns being run at once. Yeah. In a very short amount of time. And there's not a lot of um, there's not a lot of money in this right now. Like, you know, you see these house races. Mm -hmm. And the amount spent is insane. Um, you know, I think the I, I tweeted out fundraising numbers for these candidates yesterday, and the most amount raised was like twenty one thousand. Wow. Um, one candidate, Martinez, I think, loaned himself seventy five thousand. Mm -hmm. So like this, this is small potatoes in terms of campaign money. Right. So we're seeing you know delegates getting texted constantly with messaging. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing uh, mailers put out. It's just 
it's a free for all. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, and I I think one of the interesting things we're going to be at the RPT convention, and something I'll definitely be keeping my eyes on is that jockeying on the day of the vote. Yeah, Friday is the day. Friday morning. Because, at least for me, everything leading up to the vote, at some point, will not matter at all. Yeah. You know, deals will be made on that floor when the vote is happening. So um, I think that's something I'm really going to be paying attention to is who's talking to who, like who's the first person to drop off maybe, who endorses yeah. who. So it'll be interesting to watch. And uh, this will be my first experience at it's, an RPT convention. It's crazy. Okay. It's <laughs> not even just this race, you know. It's just the whole spectacle yeah. is really – fun to watch and be in the middle of yeah um it's just wild stuff wild stuff and <laughs> you know last time you saw john Cornyn stand up there and get booed by the delegates right i don't know if that's going to happen this time but um uh, just chaos yeah chaos well um something we wanted to touch on as well is um because matt mccoviak he's really austin travis county based Mm-hmm. Right, and he's the Travis County GOP chair. Yeah, um, he's also been involved in Save Austin now. Yeah, not involved. He created, started it. Started it, and um, I w- I went and checked out um, one of their meet and greet events, and a lot of what the Save Austin Outpack was talking about was the homelessness issue um, here in Austin, and something we talked about constantly, and we talked about on um, the weekly roundup is. Uh, APD, they just released their five-year strategic plan, Mm -hmm. and uh, we touched on a little bit of their staffing issues that have been going on, Um, but they actually just released their chief job description Mm -hmm. and kind of raised some eyebrows as it got circulated around um, because it has sort of, you know, it has some of the typical stuff, you know, overseeing day-to-day operations, including policies and procedures stuff you know normal stuff like that bachelor's degree in criminal justice but there was a couple of things that were mentioned in this job description that i thought would be worth talking about mm-hmm. is it says the in the job description they must also have 10 years of progressively responsible work in police administration and with at least five years as a bona fide law enforcement officer it's like okay the inclusion of the word progressive progressively responsible it's like okay what does that mean later on in the post it says that the police chief in a large city with quote issues that are similar similarly complex to those in austin they will also have ability to forge relationships with austin's many diverse communities and should have a quote sound understanding of the history of institutional racism in policing so in the inclusion of the institutional racism in policing um, this has been a constant talking point that has kind of turned some people off, not just officers, but people just viewing APD from the outside, just regular citizens, is why has APD continued to have this explicit focus on whether it be, like it mentions, institutional racism or DEI initiatives? Um, we've seen police officers here uh, as part of APD leaving the job. Um, I sort of think to myself, is this the best direction to go if the job of APD or police in general is to resolve investigations, deter criminals, and, and address crime in a city? Um, and so it's just the interesting direction, especially in a blue city like Austin, many blue cities, across the country is in the wake of George Floyd's death, 2020 riots, there was a distinct move in many of these blue cities to defund police, restructure how police operates in a Mm -hmm. city, whether it be not being as tough on certain crimes or even instituting alternative actions to addressing certain crimes not sending police officers out there, but sending maybe counselors or encouraging people to call 311 instead of 911 for certain issues, right? So um, 
encouraging them because they don't have the, uh, <laughs> they the don't staff have... to respond or answer the phone calls. Yeah, and it's just an interesting direction for me. Um, it, something I'll mention is um, it is uh, Police Officer Awareness Week, something along those lines. Um, and I came across this very interesting FBI statistic that they put out. I'll read straight from it here. It said, last year alone, 60 law enforcement officers were feloniously killed on the job, according to a report released today by the FBI. The officers killed and assaulted in the Line of Duty 2023 Special Report, which is compiled by the FBI's Criminal Justice Information Services Division, also shows that from 2021 to 2023, more officers were feloniously killed 194 than in any other consecutive three-year period in the past 20 years. So it's interesting to see these different approaches in the in this sort of milieu of rising deaths of officers. We're seeing homelessness in the city of Austin. We've seen a surge in opioid crisis, yet APD wants a police chief focused on an understanding of institutional racism. <laughs> is that going to help solve the problems that Austin is currently attempting to address? It's, it's just a matter of perspective, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I, I There's lots of experts out there that when it comes to the homelessness issue, they talk about housing first. That's a bit, that was a big initiative in not just Austin, but you know where I come from in California, and lots of reports that say that does not work. <laughs> you know, if you give people housing without services attached, then people just continue yeah. abusing drugs and alcohol. Well, the city of Austin has dealt with this firsthand. They have spent over well over five hundred million dollars to yep. build basically hotels for homeless people to live in, and. Few of them have any real stipulations. You know, the ones right. that do have stipulations are these private entities or like nonprofits. Well, but that's something. That's something too that we could go and have an entire podcast yeah, on. Yeah. Is this coordination between the NGOs and these activist groups and local government and state and federal governments is what people might not understand about these NGOs is they are run by activists who are incredibly skilled in the bureaucracy of government. And so if they identify an issue like homelessness, the way these groups get money is by applying for grants. And those grants come from local, state, and federal governments. Well, the pyramid structure of these NGOs, the people at the top are getting paid large sums of money as part of their salary. And uh, people can check out the book San Francisco by Michael Schellenberger. He details this, how the homelessness population in the homelessness industrial complex, he calls it, in California has absolutely re been wrecked by these NGOs. It is because if, let's say, a homelessness organization is, they're, not, they're identifying homelessness as an issue. Well, if people are getting paid to attempt to solve the homelessness issue, they want to keep that money flowing in. Mm -hmm. And so maybe some of their strategies isn't going to ultimately solve the problem because they want to keep that money train flowing. So um, all that I say because there's so many issues here in Austin, staffing with APD, overdoses, crime, the FBI statistics, statistics about um, officers being killed on the job it maybe people would be um, uh, it would be good to maybe take a step back and reevaluate mm -hmm. and see okay we tried some of these ideas for a few years maybe there's an alternative way to do things whether it be identifying certain populations of people that might make good recruits or alternative strategies of services first instead of housing first, um, addressing crime with um, maybe a, a different strategy other than, you know, writing tickets, but maybe being a little tougher on certain issues. Mm -hmm. So 
just for our listeners, I think that <laughs> provides a little bit of background on sort of what's going on here. Um, yeah, and it's, wanna... it's a mess in Austin. <laughs> and whoever they hire for the next as the next police chief will have their work cut out for them. Yeah. Um, you know, we've been through, first it was Brian Manley. He got the ax. Um, and then it was, he was asked to resign, basically. Um, and then you had Joseph Chacon as the interim. They hired him. Then he lasted maybe a year or two. I think, I think it was two. And now they're you know, back to square one. Um, there's The city council has a very pointed posture towards the police department. Yeah, There is very little love lost between the two. You ask rank-and-file officers what they think, and they'll tell you, uh, first of all, they can't stand the city council, at least most of the body, the body overall, and usually there's only one, Mackenzie Kelly, that they like. Mm -hmm. And then you have um, the effects that that has caused on recruitment, recruitment, and then um, that is just kind of snowballed. Yeah. And over the years, you have guys that are paying money to retire early right. because it's so bad. They don't want to be here anymore. Uh, you have, even with pay, with the pretty high pay you get in, in Austin and good benefits, they can't attract officers from other places. So you have guys working uh, double overtime to fill shifts, you have specialized units cannibalized into um, into just beat patrol because right. they can't make up for that. It's just, it is an absolute mess. And really it's on former Mayor Steve Adler, now in Congress, Greg Kassar. Um, you know, they had these ideas of ways to change policing, yeah. uh, including cutting $150 million in, I think it was 150 positions, p mm -hmm. patrol positions. Well, we've seen local businesses even hiring private security. Yeah. Like, I, because I walk the streets of Austin, and I don't see that many cops, but yeah. I see private security out yeah. in front of businesses. But then, <laughs> then on the flip side, you have, you know, the, we talked about Makoviak, and he was behind, he and Save Austin Now got two ballot props on the, on the, on the ballot. One, reinstating the camping ban, that passed. Yeah. But then the other one was to set a minimum staffing level with the police department, and that went down overwhelmingly. Now, his argument would be that the electorate in that is not reflective of what the actual city wants. And I think it's probably true, but they're not, they're not voting, right? Like, yeah. th these, these are the ones voting, so at least those, the ones having the influence on the city are the ones that at least generally hold a closer opinion to this the city council on policing than Save Austin now does. Well, I, and I think that sort of ties into the discussion we were just having a little bit ago about getting voters to the polls mm -hmm. to vote on certain ballot propositions, right? If a minimum standard for staffing goes down, well, then the people who want that minimum number standing need to get to the polls. And yeah. who is driving people to those Well, polls? the issue is there's no minimum standard, I don't yeah. think. And so they were trying to set one. Yeah. It's a mess, man. <laughs> um, overall, you know, also, it should be noted, Austin is a safe city. That doesn't mean it's not getting worse, because it is. Yeah. Um, compared to Chicago or Houston, and the crime levels are not even close. But it is definitely trending in a bad direction. Um, and it's made even worse by the lack of the ability for the police department to patrol the city. You yeah. know, that's, that's not good. Yeah. It's not good for anybody. Yeah. So it's spiraling. Yeah. And it has been for a while. Yeah. This is not new. But it's getting worse. Yeah. Well, it'll be interesting to see who they hire in this new chief position, especially with, like we mentioned, the explicit focus in the job description about being trained and understanding institutional racism. Mm -hmm. The people selecting who the candidate and eventual nominee for that position will be, will they, do they have that same mindset or is it, are they starting to see the issues and say, maybe we want someone with a different approach? It's just something we'll have to find yeah. out. <laughs> we'll have to live through it. Yeah. Um, we'll move to the next story here. You actually sent me this. It was a story out of the dispatch here. Yeah, Jonah Goldberg. Um, he wrote a story called The Tea Party Movement Died. 
with a whimper. Mm -hmm. And very interesting piece, sort of going through um, how different aspects of libertarianism, Tea Party movement, um, people are kind of turning away from that now. Uh, they might like some of the policy positions, but they're electing people who are signaling those positions, but then they just really want someone to maybe wreck the system. Yeah. Right. And so he pointed out uh, some interesting things in here. Um, I'll read directly from the article here. He said, the media and Democrats figured out how to convince people that the Tea Parties were actually racist and fascist and all that. And I think that helped radicalize a lot of Tea Partiers, causing them to embrace things like nationalism and status power politics. I'm here to write about a different cautionary tale, but I should at least acknowledge another. The elite's media moral panic over the Tea Parties succeeded in helping to destroy the movement, but what replaced it was far worse. I've lost count of the progressives who simultaneously tell me they're nostalgic for the libertarianism of the pre-Trump right and re rejoice in calling conservatives hypocrites for abandoning it. Maybe if they responded in good faith at that time, it would have endured. That reminds me of the uh, the classic, you know, newfound respect in among like pres specifically in this regard, presidential candidates. You know, mm -hmm. George Bush was the worst thing ever to the left. You know, this happens on the other side too, right? Like, but it's really pronounced on the left. I'd say um, George Bush is, you know, literally Hitler mm -hmm. until you have Mitt Romney there. Mm -hmm. Then he's literally Hitler mm -hmm. and the, you know, women in binders and all that stuff. Yeah. But then when you have Donald Trump, he's the worst thing ever now. Right. And those guys, they long for the days of, of when those guys were, you know, it's, it's rank politics and hyperbole, which happens all over the place. But it's just funny to see, you know. Well, I, th let's, I think talking a little bit about the media's aspect in this. Because um, like you mentioned, this isn't a new phenomenon of labeling maybe conservative right-wing candidates as literally Hitler, fascist, whatever it may be. Um, but in the advent of more activist media, with the proliferation of social media, everyone has access to information on their phones these days. And Politics has now become much more personalized than it was maybe before. Mm -hmm. Just the fact that people might not re reach out for information from traditional outlets anymore. They have their favorite alternative outlet. They may have their favorite commenter. Mm -hmm. And the media barriers aren't necessarily there anymore for good and for bad. And so it allows the media to put out those hyperbolic statements much more easily and reach people much more easily. And so I think that's an interesting aspect of this, how a ch how you can change people's perspective based on the type of information. We've already known that, but we're just in a new information sphere mm -hmm. with how personal things have gotten, yeah. the access to it. And I think it was interesting as well in this article that he touched on someone like um, Thomas Massey. He said um, here, so he, he was all, this was sort of leading into um, because Freedom Works was, had said they were going to be shutting their doors, mm. right? So uh, that's a little bit of context here. So what does this have to, this is reading from the article. So what does this have to do with the end of Freedom Works, the libertarian populism? of the Tea Party era died because the animating passion wasn't really libertarianism in the first place. Tim Carney beat me to the punch, punch by quoting uh, Rep. Thomas Massey's Tea Party replacement theory, quote, all this time, Massey explained in 2017, I thought they were voting for libertarian Republicans, but after some soul searching, I realized when they voted for Rand or Ron Paul and me in these primaries, they weren't voting for libertarian ideas. They were voting for the craziest son of a B <laughs> in the race, and Donald Trump won best in class. So that sort of touches on uh, the idea that pe people want to wreck the system now. Mm -hmm. They're completely fed up with stat the status quo. And But it's also funny because the view of the status quo 
shifts, like what is the status quo, you know? The assessment of the realities of it behind it, it shifts constantly. Everyone has a different idea, right? And, you know, establishment is a slur now, but at least when he was in office, you know who the establishment was? Trump. Trump. Um, at least in large part, you know, he filled all these all these um, bureaucratic agencies, you know. Um, I think that's I, – I, I, He I controls do. the Republican Party right now. He's – He's the most powerful endorsement in Republican politics at the moment. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I I think when Trump was in office, being someone who was an outsider to elected office, he might have relied on some um, bad advice, <laughs> let's say. And uh, there was also issues with the bureaucratic nature of federal government where they were, you know, lying to him in some instances mm-hmm. about issues. So um, there, I, I think the idea about what Goldberg writes in what I just read about people wanting the craziest son of a bee in the race is people are much more aware now mm-hmm. of the quote unquote deep state. You can think it's real, you can think it's fake, but as we've seen, there is things happening behind the scenes whether it be we've seen with the Twitter files, um, we've seen with how large and out of control many of these bureaucratic agencies have gotten. They're Mm -hmm. not being held accountable economically, for instance, like we just touched on with the grant funding and things of that nature. So um, I think when you put all that into context and people wanting to just vote in someone that is going to say, I'm going to fight against the system. You can empathize with that perspective because uh, if people who have been consistent, constant Republican voters, but they've just seen the country move in a more leftward direction, they've seen the bureaucratic nature of the, the federal government continue to bloat, they see taxes continuing to rise in different instances, and maybe their living standards are changing, not in the right direction. They just throw their hands up and they say, I want someone to go in there and fight Mm -hmm. instead of playing bipartisan games. So I I, I just thought I would maybe contextualize (laughs) some of those voters' perspectives, why they want to vote for those crazy, quote unquote, crazy people. Because in their eyes, they see them as, well, they're they're going to be fighting for me. Yeah, I don't have a voice. They can be my voice. Yep. Yeah. Also, you know, it shows that Connie, our founder, she came up in the Tea Party. That's how she became politically relevant at all. Um, and you know, I remember my dad talking about. I was way too young to vote, really pay attention much at all at that point. But I remember my dad talking about it. He went to a couple of rallies, and um, it. It seems it, Goldberg's point uh, argument here is that the ideological principles that were voiced during the Tea Party movement mm-hmm. were really just window dressing. That this was under the, in the underbelly the whole time, and I think that's what Massey's getting at as well in this. But I don't know that's exactly correct because there was a real shift, and there were some real policy accomplishments made by. Tea Party candidates, mm-hmm. um, sequestration is probably the biggest. You know who put the final nail in the coffin of the sequestration? Tell me. Donald Trump. So I don't know if it's that this was there all along or if things really shifted. You know, from priorities shifted from ideolo- ideological principles, limited government, low taxes, uh, eliminate regulation, that kind of thing, to now just being pissed off, you know, and cage rattling at the system. To me, that seems more likely um, than they just took off the mask and this was them the whole time. I don't know. I don't know. What do you think? Uh, Well, uh, I think you bring up an interesting point is where the, like you were saying, a movement away from principles and ideals to just rattling the cage, was that always there? Or has it been a deliberate shift? And 
I think it is a deliberate shift. Okay. For the reason is you get swallowed up in the system as an elected official. You know, you can listen to elected uh, congressmen and senators. They, they, they will tell it. They get sit down at dinners with lobbyists and they say, you got to do this or do that, or I'm going to endorse send money to your opposition, whatever it may be, right? Mm -hmm. And those who hold chairmanships or who are uh, majority party leaders, it, they kind of are steering the ship of how people vote. And I think there was a deliver deliberate move by these newer officials to say, we're not going to do that. We're going to be loud and fight against what they call the uniparty. It's people cowtailing to big lobbyists, the big bureaucracy, the leaders in the party. So I, people should also understand it doesn't have to remain this way mm -hmm. either. There needs to be a plan for after. So it's a transition period where if you're going to be that person who rattles the cage, tries to bring awareness to certain issues, then what's the follow-up to What's that? the game plan what's the game to get plan? things done, right? Well, and so <laughs> going back to where we started with these different polls yeah. of the RPT chair, it's, it's, again, these polls are exemplified in who's getting elected to office mm -hmm. at the federal level. And is it a transition where we need to elect these rage cat, uh, rattlers, cage rattlers, so people become aware and then we can then vote the right people who will be principled in their ideals or is the end game just to break everything up mm -hmm. well the the two arguments that are kind of jockeying for position here is that um you can well we have to govern ourselves into doing nothing or doing things that are entirely antithetical to what we ran on in the first place. And then on the other side you have, you can throw grades enough, a grenade, enough grenades to where you find yourself in the position now where you have governing responsibility and what do you do with that? Mm -hmm. You realize it's a lot more difficult. Look at, look at the Texas House and the school choice fight. Mm -hmm. It is a lot harder to get policy across the line than anyone thinks when they're running a campaign. You can't just snap it into existence. Mm -hmm. It takes compromise, which is not a, a fun word right now for most party activists uh, on either side. You mm -hmm. know, everyone's just wanting to throw grenades. Um, but in order to get things across the line, like votes are the votes. Mm -hmm. And unless you can persuade enough representatives in whatever body we're talking about to support whatever policy it is you want, you, go, you get nothing. You get nothing. And... Mm -hmm. That's the, the issue here. How, at, the, at the same time, you try and avoid compromising yourself into supporting something that is entirely antithetical to what you ran on. You also have to be willing to compromise in order to get anything you want done. Yeah. Um, but we see that the two extremes of, of the parties kind of running things right now, at least from a, um, a PR perspective, I think. Yeah, and I think... What's interesting is we're talking a lot about tactics mm -hmm. here, but I sort of see things. There's the tactics, what we're talking about, the grenade throwing. <laughs> there's the uh, strategy, like it, do you have to be bipartisan? Do you have to make compromises? But then there's also the vision mm -hmm. is what are you ultimately trying to get to? And this article is talking a lot about the tactics, but it's also talking about uh, the strategy and the vision is there's lots of disagreements over what it means to be conservative, what does it mean to be a Republican. Mm -hmm. And I think until you get someone who can clearly lay out and articulate what is the vision for a Republican these days, you're going to constantly get these low-level tactic battles because – um, it's something I've continued to explore in my newsletters. I talk about it constantly yeah. <laughs> in the office is there's so many disagreements about what it means to be a Republican. And it's not just ideas on policy. It's ideas on principles and ideals themselves. Mm -hmm. 
And I think, like I said, in tell, priorities, in priorities, what's the top, what's the priority list here? You know, everyone disagrees on that. Yeah. And I think whether it be an elected official at the top of the ticket, like Donald Trump, is he going to be able to lay out a vision for the country? Or is it a group of powerful Congress members or senators that get together and say, this is what we're about? Is it think tanks and activist groups that get together and say, this is the future of the Republican Party? But there needs to be some clear vision so people know what direction Mm -hmm. things are going to lead to. So I think... (laughs) I think we beat that dead horse enough, yeah. Yeah. But Uh, it's... Politics is a constant tug of war. Yeah. It always will be, and it always has been. Yeah. So let's m- touch briefly on a couple things I had um, here is the Harrison Bucker speech. Ooh, yeah, that set the sports world ablaze. Yeah, so Harrison Bucker, uh, kicker for the Kansas City Chiefs, um, he gave a commencement speech. Um, do you remember the name of the college? It was Benedictine College University. It was a Catholic university, I believe. Benedictine College in Atchison, Kansas. Okay. And he caused quite a bit of stir um, because he talked about the importance of motherhood, the importance of being a wife. He also talked about... And by the way, he's a very Catholic Very person. much. And very yes, vocal very religious, about his yeah. faith. And these aren't new things that he said either. No. <laughs> you know, you can go back. And Everyone has known where he stood on things for um, a long time. But I think what was really interesting about what he said, too, was he talked about the ideas of masculinity. And I'll read directly from his speech here. He said, be unapologetically in, unapologetic in your masculinity, fighting against the culture emasculation of men. Do hard things. Never settle for what is easy. You might have a talent that you don't necessarily enjoy, but it glorifies God. Maybe you should lean into that over something that you might think suits you better. So touching uh, touching on ideas of masculinity, motherhood, uh, the importance of, uh, of being a wife, things some media outlets... Um, Push back against, let's say. And so uh, there was actually a comment from the NFL that came out that said, um, Harrison Bucker gave a speech in his personal capacity. His views are not those of the NFL as an organization. That came from the senior vice president, Jonathan Bean, the league's chief diversity and inclusion officer. The NFL is steadfast in our commitment to inclusion, which only makes our league stronger. And then GLAD, which is a um, LGBTQ organization also issued a statement calling Bucker's, Bucker's speech a clear miss and woefully out of step with America about pride, LGBTQ people, and women. So we saw right after the speech, though, as all these media hits were coming out, you showed me jersey sales. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he shot up to number one. Both in men and women's categories. Right. Yeah. So speech, his speech really landing with, you know, regular people. At least a large amount, enough to <laughs> To go out and buy, yeah. buy his jersey. Not landing much with the media. Or maybe some... I think I've seen this story before. I think I have, too. Oh. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I just think, I just thought it would be important to mention that um, despite what the media might be training his speech about, uh, might be about, they say it's about misogyny, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. But in reality, he's just talking about the importance of motherhood, the importance of masculinity, really doing the best you can within your own personal capacity. Yeah. These are not really controversial controversial positions, um, at least among, especially the average football fan. Right. Um, You know, the sport that's the closest thing we have to gladiators. (laughs) You're right. Also, the things that are said in locker rooms, <laughs> in these football locker rooms especially, but take any sports locker room. Yeah. I've been in them in high school. Imagine when you have the best of the best in the room together. Yeah. It, it, this is cake. This is tame. Compared yeah. to what you would hear in there. Yeah. Um, but also, it's, you know, this is a, this is, the viewpoint of a large portion of individuals, you know, whether you agree with it or not, 
this is not outside the Overton window that we like to talk about so much, mm -hmm. even though a lot of the media would like it to be. Right. Um, the, the, the fallout from this was hilarious. You know, there was something, he had some pointed language in there, um, you know, calling working a distraction or it can be a distraction depending on what your priorities in life are. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, this is, is pretty tame. The reactions were, as usual, unhinged generally, but there were also some pretty funny ones. Okay. So, uh, you know, first of all, you have people talk about how, um, you know, the NFL puts out a statement against Bucker here. Yeah. Uh, but then they allow, like, they give Ray Rice a, was it a six-game suspension for yeah. knocking out his girlfriend? Or who was, yeah, that, and then there was the running, another running back. Yeah, Kareem Hunt. Kareem Hunt. Yeah. It's been an issue for a while. Like, yeah. Um, that's that's an image problem the NFL's been trying to clean up for a while now. Yeah. Um, and then on the flip side, on, on, on the other political spectrum, you have people um, talking about how the NFL's not going hard enough on Butker, and they basically blackballed Colin Kaepernick for making his mm. uh, position for state, statements on, like, especially BLM, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So they're just throwing bombs at each other. But the funniest thing was... Uh, the Chargers, so the NFL schedules got released. And when, oh. when that happens, teams usually do like a video and it's yeah. funny to uh, unveil the, their um, their schedules. There was one from the Titans a couple years ago. I saw the Titans one. Yeah, that's, that's the greatest one that they're, they're asking uh, random people in Nashville on the street. Uh, they're showing them like the logo of the team and asking them to name who that is so they can unveil it as their... Uh, their opponent that yeah. week, and they go week by week, and it was it, every single one was wrong. wrong. Um, <laughs> the Jaguars I, logo, no one could get. No one got it. <laughs> there was one where two people called the Colts the Cowboys. Yeah, um, they were. <laughs> and they were so, so sure pumping, about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's definitely the Cowboys. No, the Cowboys is the one with the star, not the not the you know the, the horseshoe. Horse shoe, yeah. um, but in that, at the tail end. They had a couple – throughout the whole thing, they had some nuggets. Like Taylor Swift was in it. It was uh, the Chargers. Yeah. It was Sims-related, the, vi the video game. Mm. And they had Taylor Swift, the Kelsey brothers doing their podcast. Um, but at the end, they had, they had Aaron Rodgers being afraid of cell phone towers. <laughs> I didn't <laughs> see 5G. that. 5G, yeah, that was right after the Butker thing. Um, and having a radioactive baby. Uh, but then with Butker, they had him in the kitchen. <laughs> because, of course, people were taking his statements of running with, oh, he just yeah. wants women to be in the kitchen, yada, yeah. yada, yada. Yeah. Um, but the Chargers were – that was hilarious. Yeah. The, the, the fun they poked at him and a bunch of people on it. Yeah. But um, – Overall, like, this is going to go away. This is not going to – Yeah. It, this is a, a day story, maybe a week story, because mm -hmm. uh, nothing else is happening right now <laughs> in, in the NFL. But no one's going to care. Like, he's the best kicker in the league or one of the top, one of the best three, two or three. Yeah. He's on arguably the best team in the, in the world. Mm -hmm. They just won the Super Bowl. Well, I think it exemplifies the stratification that's sort of going yeah. on is – talked about the media this isn't something new going after certain opinions and then not really going after others um but we've really seen a large defense of what bucker said by a lot of media outlets too yeah. a lot of individuals online coming to his defense so all this talk and none of it's about football <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> right well um i we have just a little bit of time left i thought it'd be fun to touch on MTG, AOC, Jasmine Crockett. They got into it. Oh. At a House Oversight Committee here. I would like to say I'm surprised, but I'm not. <laughs> so there was something. They were just going back and forth at one point. There was comments here I'll read from. I'd like to know. This is from MTG, Marjorie Taylor Greene. I'd like to know if any Democrats on the committee are employing Judge Merchant's daughter. Um, just, then Jasmine Crockett says, please tell me what that has to do with Merrick Garland. Uh, MTG responds by saying, I think your fake eyelashes are messing up what you're reading. And just, just set it off. They were going after each other on, about how they look. 
people screaming out, strike that from the record, strike that. <laughs> and you can just see people. It's this is. I'm sure people will come across it. Just look at everyone else at that committee hearing, just shaking their heads, close their <laughs> eyes, like, please make it stop, please make it stop, <laughs> because it's it's so interesting that. Uh, these types of things that are happening yeah. in our federal government. Well, <laughs> let me add something. <laughs> Go you ahead. Know, I, I made this point on something totally different in in the um, uh, the fourth reading newsletter this week. Okay. This is not new. This this name calling. You know, uh, the example I use all the time is John Adam or Thomas Jefferson's hit hitman and. Um, in the campaign called John Adams a hermaphrodite, you know? Um, uh, Adams hit back that Jefferson wanted to legalize incest. Right. These personal pot shots are not new in politics. It, it's definitely not good, right? Like right. That, that's another, th- that's, that's a side aspect of this, but yeah. um, these two getting in a fight, you know, it's, it's just it's not it's, it's not new we, we, we can both be um you know kind of astounded this happened and understand the perspective right yeah yeah I, I i just thought it was hilarious you know having it caught on film people sharing it around it makes for a, a hilarious story it makes for a sure. hilarious story um but there's precedent for this yeah. People, maybe they did it in a slightly different way. Mm-hmm. Maybe they used some different language, some better prose, maybe, and <laughs> uh, not really just insulting each other. Bring back the eloquent <laughs> insults. Bring it back. People. Not just saying, "Oh, your your uh, eyelashes are fake." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have some real prose behind our our insults we're lobbing. You know. Right. Well, maybe Marjorie Taylor Greene will sit sit behind her computer and really type out a nice eloquent response to what happened and Jasmine Crockett will do the same and we can enter a new era of political disagreement back and forth papers (laughs) but I don't think that's gonna happen I'm not very hopeful sorry about that ran on your parade there yeah um anything uh you want to mention uh, before we leave, we are we are going to be headed to the RPT convention. Like mm-hmm. I mentioned, this is coming out um, after the Monday after the Monday after. So, which um, is also the day before the runoffs. Day before the runoffs. So we didn't talk about that much at all, but that's gonna, we're going to have a lot of coverage of that. Tons of coverage. Coverage of the convention. It's it, this is like the last gasp of craziness in Texas politics for the moment before we hit the summer lull. There's, there's just going to be a lull. There always is in the summer. Everyone goes on vacation. Everyone's tired of, of politics. Right. Um, it'll pick back up in late August, early September. But, yeah, glad you're along for the ride. And Yeah, it's going to be fun. Always is. <laughs> Not, more than enough to cover and uh, plenty to work with, that's yeah. for sure. Well, uh, I think that does it for the third episode of Semi Some Stuff. Thank you everyone for listening. And if you ever come across articles and you want us to talk about it, send us some stuff. We'll check it out next time.